What if I told you that the digital revolution, the same one that brought us smartphones, the internet and AI, was merely the warm-up act? The two greatest mysteries in all of science, in all of science, the two greatest mysteries are, one, what happened before creation? Mm -hmm. Why did we have a Big Bang? What banged? Are there other universes, a multiverse, mm. before the Big Bang? That's outer space. Then the second mystery is inner space. Yes. <laughs> what goes on behind your eyeballs? We have a hundred billion neurons in your brain, as many as stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Each neuron is connected to 10,000 other neurons. And so what is the brain? Physicist Michio Kaku believes we're standing on the edge of something infinitely more powerful, the dawn of quantum intelligence, a force so transformative it could render today's supercomputers obsolete and turn artificial intelligence into something dangerously close to godlike. In this new age, computers won't just crunch numbers. They'll simulate reality, predict biology, and potentially outthink humanity. Welcome to the age of quantum AI, where the line between machine and mind begins to blur. We're engineering systems that compute the very atoms of matter. AI with some of the tools that it needs. Quantum computing and artificial intelligence are two of the most transformational technologies of our time. Together, their processing power and decision-making capabilities could revolutionize various industries. The world is quantum, right? You know, you probe down to the level of chemistry and chemical reactions and things, it's how do atoms and molecules interact. David Lucas is a physics professor at Oxford. Lucas's team has recently made a significant leap in the technology by successfully interconnecting two separate quantum processors to form a single quantum computer. By joining small quantum devices, they've enabled computations to be distributed across the network, theoretically without any limit to the number of processors that could be involved. That could potentially crack the technology's scalability problem, according to study lead Dougal Main. So building a large quantum computer is very technically challenging. And what we showed that you could do is you could split a large, one of these large quantum computers up into several smaller modules and interconnect them using these uh, optical fiber links. Quantum computers operate on qubits, quantum bits that exist in a state of superposition, both zero and one at the same time. They also exploit entanglement, meaning two particles can mirror each other's state, even if separated by galaxies. It's the stuff of science fiction, except it's already real. Governments know it. Agencies like the CIA, NSA, and even China's surveillance state are pouring resources into this arms race, where the battlefield isn't steel and gunpowder. It's information itself. Quantum supremacy isn't a theoretical goal anymore. It's a finish line we're already sprinting toward. Why? Because whoever masters quantum computing will rewrite the rules of security, economics, warfare, and medicine. We've gone through three major computing stages. First was the analog era, mechanical computers made of gears and pulleys, like the ancient Antikythera mechanism or Babbage's difference engine. Then came the digital age led by Alan Turing with computers that function using binary code, ones and zeros running on silicon transistors. But transistors have physical limits. That's where the late Richard Feynman came in he asked the big question, what happens when a transistor is the size of an atom? The answer, you enter the quantum domain where reality itself behaves unpredictably. Think of Schrodinger's cat, dead and alive at the same time until observed. That paradox? It's the foundation of how quantum computers work. They compute not in one reality, but in many simultaneously. They don't simulate possibilities, they live in them meaning an operation in one region might instantaneously affect another. Communication without time delay, computation without limits. The concern isn't just about cryptographic vulnerability anymore. It's about what happens when machines start asking questions no human ever programmed them to ask. The roots of this revolution stretch back further than most realize. In 1900, Max Planck proposed that energy exists in discrete packets, quanta. This simple idea upended classical physics and birthed the strange world of quantum mechanics. Later, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and the EPR paradox proposed by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen exposed the non-local, 
unpredictable nature of the subatomic world. These weren't just academic debates. They hinted at a realm where information behaves in ways we still can't fully map, but which quantum computers exploit as their native terrain. You see, computers have gone through three basic stages. Stage one was the analog computer. So 2,000 years ago, there was a shipwreck, and in the boat that sank was a device. And when you brushed away the dirt and debris, you began to realize that it was a machine, a machine of incredible complexity. It was, in fact, the world's first analog computer, and it was designed to map the motion of the moon, the sun, and the planets to simulate the universe. But the benefits, if unlocked, are staggering. Imagine solving world hunger by figuring out nitrogen fixation, something digital computers can't fully simulate. Imagine stable fusion power, clean and infinite, thanks to quantum simulations of plasma dynamics or decoding diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's at the molecular level by modeling complex biomolecules in ways our current technology simply can't. Kaku's message is clear. The digital revolution changed our tools, the quantum revolution will change us. Every digital computer is a Turing machine. The next step beyond digital computers is the quantum era. Richard Feynman was one of the founders of quantum electrodynamics, but also a visionary. And he asked himself a simple question, how small can you make a transistor? And he realized that the ultimate transistor is an atom, one atom that could control the flow of electricity, not just on or off, but everything in between. We have to go to quantum computers, computers that compute on atoms rather than on transistors. Transistors are based on zeros and one, zeros and one. Reality is not. Reality is based on electrons and particles, and these particles in turn act like waves. So you have to have a new set of mathematics to discuss the waves that make up a molecule. And that's where quantum computers come in. They're based on electrons. And these electrons, how come they have so much computational power? because they could be in two places at the same time. That's what gives quantum computers their power. They compute not just one universe, but an infinite number of parallel universes. At the fundamental level, quantum mechanics can be reduced down to a cat, Schrodinger's cat. Let's take a box. In the box, you put a cat. And the question is, is the cat dead or alive? Well, until you open the box, you don't know. It is alive and dead simultaneously. It's in a superposition of two states. In other words, the universe has split in half. In one half, the cat is alive. In the other universe, the cat is dead. That's the basis of quantum theory, that until you make a measurement, the cat can exist in both states simultaneously. In fact, in any number of states simultaneously. The cat could be dead, alive, playing, jumping, sideways, sick, any number of states. Quantum computers compute on parallel universes. That's why they are so powerful. So how much faster is a quantum computer over a digital computer? In principle, infinitely faster. When we talk about digital computers, we can measure their power in terms of bits. For example, spin up, spin down, zeros and one would constitute one bit. For a large digital computer, we're now talking about billions of bits that are modeled by transistors, except now, Quantum computers talk not just about spin up or spin down, but everything in between. That's called a qubit. One qubit represents all the possibilities of an object spinning between up and down. Thousands of qubits can now be modeled with the latest generation of quantum computers. Eventually, we hope to hit a million. And so we're talking about exceeding the power of ordinary digital computers. That's called quantum supremacy. It is the point at which a quantum computer can outrace and outperform a digital computer on a certain task. We passed that several years ago, but we want a machine that can exceed the power of any digital computer. We're not there yet, but we're very close to it. The number one problem facing quantum computers is the question of decoherence. Everything is based on particles like electrons, and electrons have waves associated with them. When these waves are vibrating in unison, it's called coherence, and then you can do calculations of a quantum mechanical nature. But if you fall out of coherence, then everything vibrates at a different frequency. And what is that called? Noise. You have to reduce the temperature down to near absolute zero, so everything is pretty much vibrating slowly in unison. That's difficult. Take a look, for example, of food supply. The green revolution that allows us to feed the population of the world is slowly coming to an end. 
We're trying to use quantum computers to unlock the secret of how to make fertilizer from nitrogen. Take a look at energy. Quantum computers may be able to create fusion power by stabilizing the super hot hydrogen inside a fusion reactor. And take a look at medicine. You realize that life is based on molecules. Molecules that can create Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, cancer. These diseases are beyond the reach of digital computers. But hey, this is what quantum computers do. We'll be able to model diseases at the molecular level. And that's why we hope to cure the incurable by using quantum computers. We're talking about turning medicine upside down. So what happens when machines stop following our commands and start asking their own questions? Michio Kaku and other visionaries aren't warning us for fun. They're sounding the alarm because the age of godlike machines isn't a sci-fi fantasy anymore. It's a ticking reality. Quantum AI won't just be powerful. It'll be alien, non-linear, and possibly unknowable. The genie's out of the bottle. The only question is, can we guide it or will it guide us? If you found this glimpse into our quantum future as mind-bending as we did, be sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. Let's spark the conversation while we still can.